Oi, mate. Come and join me on the adventure of a lifetime, where today we find the source of the optical swamp. Hello, I would like to welcome you to the Laramie K Optician Works Training Center, where today we are in fact going to talk about where that unwanted peripheral distortion in a progressive lens comes from. Now, make absolutely certain that every progressive lens in your optical life comes from Laramie K. If you're watching me on YouTube, please do hit the subscribe button down there in the corner. If you're watching us on Facebook, give us a like, it sure does help us out. No project that we have ever undertaken in the two plus years that we have been doing this has given me more trouble than this one. Let's see if we can't clear it up a little bit. Where does the Opti Swamp and the land of optical garbage come from? If you are not familiar with those two terms, we did some videos back a couple months ago. Um, those two there, if you haven't watched those, then by all means go ahead and do that and then come back and join us. I had two questions that I wanted to answer through this video. One was what kind of language, what kinds of things would you like to hear an optician tell a customer when they ask, why is there that peripheral distortion in a progressive lens? And there is no easy answer. Hopefully you'll develop something out of this and what's to follow. The other piece is the more optical, more mechanical piece of where that distortion comes from. And we get really close to answering that. One. What would you say to a customer? This may seem a little flippant, but it really isn't. You can't have your cake and eat it too, right? That, I mean, that's a good, a good place to start in answering that question. What is the first rule of optical? To get something, you have to give up something. The golden rule of optics. Number three. The more you ask of something, the less likely it will do them well, right? It's like the Swiss army knife. Yes, it can do 140 different things, all of them kind of poorly, and it weighs seven pounds. Not really a very useful tool in reality. A sports car is not an SUV, and an SUV is not a sports car. If you try to take your Ferrari down a Jeep trail, you're not going to get very far. If you try to take your SUV to the racetrack, it's going to go off and crash. So you can't really combine things in that way. And that is what you're asking a progressive lens to do. Some things that it really can't, right? A progressive is a choice of vanity and convenience over optics. Never ever forget that. Let's, let's repeat it. I'll get out of the way here. A progressive lens is a choice of vanity and convenience over optics. It is a compromise lens. It is a compromised lens. I mentioned in the opening sequence that this was the most difficult piece that we have ever assembled. And it turns out that there simply is no easy answer to where the distortion in the peripheral of a progressive lens comes from. And oh, how we tried. Uh, we have unprecedented access up and down the supply chain from the very top to the very bottom. We asked everyone and we never ever came close to a really good solid answer and or model of some kind. The closest we got is a paper written by Daryl Meister. Daryl was a genius at taking extraordinarily complex optical concepts and making them fairly user-friendly. His paper is called The Fundamentals of Progressive Lens Design. There are two places that you can find that. And Daryl did give us permission to use that through the Laramie K site. 
And even in that paper, Daryl uses an executive trifocal to begin explaining the concept. And then when actually describing how cylinder becomes the answer to blending those zones, he uses a Plano front base curve with the cylinder to show you how a progressive lens is designed. Now, what is an executive trifocal, that thing there, and a Plano front base curve have in common? Well, they have a straight line or straight lines. Now, this is one of the things I picked up from one of the industry people. If you want to put two different optical mediums, if you will, together, the best way to do that is a straight line. Taking, for instance, again, the executive trifocal. Look at it, right? If you wanted perfect, clean, crisp vision from nose to temple or temporal to nasal across a lens for distance intermediate and near, that would be as close as you can get. Now it's hideous, right? I mean, it's not optically very good. It doesn't hold an AR coat. They look terrible. They're heavy. They don't fit in a frame well, but that is as close as you're ever going to get from full width, wall to wall, if you will, clear distance, intermediate and near. Again, remember a progressive lens is a compromised lens and a compromised lens. So nobody liked the look of that, so we went to segmented lenses, right? Distance, intermediate, near for a straight top trifocal, straight top bifocal, what do you have in common still? A straight line dividing those. You can see them, there is a jump between them. If I'm looking straight on, what have I done? I've taken my shallowest curve, added a steeper one, added a steeper one again for my bifocal and my trifocal area leaving ledges, leaving lines, leaving things you can see, giving you that little bit of image jump, but what do people want? People want this. They want it to look seamless, beautiful. And there is the advantage of having that smooth transition between your distance, your intermediate, and your near powers. It's kind of nice that way. So yes, progressive lenses are good for some things. Let's dig into that just a little bit more. How do we go from this or this to this. All right, indulge me for a moment. Think of the nominal lens formula, right? The nominal lens formula is the diopter power of a lens is equal to its front curve added to its back curve expressed as diopters. I think we can all agree on that. It's very basic. It doesn't work for everything anymore, particularly freeform progressives, etc. But it's a really good thing to start with. The nominal lens formula is not, well, kind of sort of the power is equal to, well, somewhere in the vicinity of this curve plus eh, that curve, give or take a little bit. All right, following me here, all right? Y you have to have absolutes. If my lens power for this person to see clearly in the distance is a minus one, and the front base curve of my lens design is a plus six, I still need a minus seven, hopefully right about here where their eye is for distance, to get my minus one. There's no way around that, all right? Then if I have an add of a plus two, I still need plus one at intermediate and an additional plus one at near. Where do we do that? Generally on the front of the lens, we add the segment, all right? If I have a lined trifocal, that thing again, and I have three distinct areas from edge to edge, that's really easy to do. If I want this to be invisible, if I want these things to blend together and work smoothly, the smoothly part's fairly easy, the blending together, that's very, very hard to do. Look at that trifocal, the executive trifocal one more time. Where those different segments come together, look at the ledge. That has to be there, has to be. 
right? For clarity, for this to work, you can't get past the nominal lens formula. It has to be there. Those curves have to exist. If I blend them, smooth them, somehow fill in that gap, make them invisible, you're gonna have some issues. Let's take a look at cylinder and then we'll hit the bench. We should all be very, very familiar with the concept of a sphere. It is an object like the top half of this bowl. It measures the same radius of curvature in every direction. The second piece to lens design is the cylinder or the sphero cylinder lens. A cylinder looks like this and a cylinder it has a variable radius of curvature. It's going to have a plano, it's going to have a primary with its steepest curve, and if I lens clocked it, absolutely every point between my primary and my zero is going to have a different radius of curvature. It's what makes a cylinder lens. Now, the Opti Swamp in the land of optical garbage is unwanted cylinder. You read it, you see it, you hear it, Distortion in the periphery of a progressive lens is unwanted cylinder. Now, what exactly does that mean? I'm going to take this. I'm going to take that illustration from Daryl Meister's white paper, and we're going to see if I can't help you a little bit more with the visualization or conceptualization of the idea of where cylinder becomes unwanted cylinder, which becomes distortion in the periphery of a progressive. Now, this is very much a visualization conceptualization piece. I'm going to show you a Plano base curve that blends into a very fixed radius curve to, for the add power in a bifocal, which is how Daryl has it set up. You can see it. It's beautiful. Of course, in reality, all of those curves are much, much more complex and, of course, require extremely sophisticated modeling to come even close to reducing that error. Let's take a look at our executive trifocal just one last time. Notice the area where the different radiuses of curvature are close to one another, almost touching. Notice how as we leave that center line of the lens, the ledge increases sharply. In extremely simple terms, we can think of that center line, number two, as what becomes our progressive lens corridor? We can think of the red and yellow edges or ledges becoming unwanted cylinder when we smooth them out or blend them. Let's make a 3D model of Daryl's illustration and see if we can't make that a little clearer. Speaking of Play-Doh, I just wanted to show you what it says on the side of the container which I think means that Play-Doh is not gluten-free. And our Play-Doh is going to work for two things today, our 3D modeling and a gentle reminder of the color spectrum. One last time, there are three other videos in this series about progressive lenses, progressive lens design. Please watch those in addition to this one. Never forget that every optical lens is a compromise in some way. Single vision, line bifocal, line trifocal, executive, progressive. I'm not picking on progressives here. They're a wonderful lens, take you from sunup to sundown, everything in between, they're super useful. But like every other lens, they're also not perfect. What's this all about? It's about unwanted cylinder. Here is my cylinder. Remember, Plano, one place. Primary steepest curve, variability in curvature across the entire rest of its surface. What are we going to be implementing to create a progressive? I'm going to be implementing exactly one half of that cylinder amount. So what do I have? I've got a Play-Doh cylinder. There it is. That looks quite a bit like that. Now, if we take Daryl's example and we cut out that and that, look what happens when I put my cylinder in there. Because he chose to use a Plano front base curve, 
The Plano leading edge, the flat edge of my cylinder matches there. Because of the variability of the curvature of the cylinder, it matches the curve of my bifocal, my add, my steeper curve down here. That is how we blend the areas between our different needs for distance, intermediate, and near in a progressive lens cylinder. Now, remember, I've got my center line right there where they touch. That's where my decent optics are going to be. That's where I'm going to have my distance area out until I start hitting that cylinder. I have my narrow channel here, my corridor between them, because this is also, of course, happening on the other side as well. And then I've got that familiar shape that we all know for our near power down below. The source of the optical swamp and the land of optical garbage. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you again next week.